Okay, I think we have enough of a critical mass to start. Uh, my name is Ken Stern. I am the director of the Bard Center for the Study of Hate. Uh, I, I'm uh, thankful for Philippe Sands coming and spending the uh, hour with us today to talk about his new book and the issues about hate that it um, brings forth. Uh, Philippe uh, is a uh, professor and he's a British and French lawyer at Matrix Chambers and professor of law and director of the Center for International Courts and Tribunals at the University College London. He's a specialist in international law, has appeared as counsel and advocate before many international courts and tribunals, including the International Court of Justice, uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights and the International Criminal Court He's the author of 17 books on international law. His book, East Meets West Street on the Origins of the Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity has been awarded numerous prizes. Um, and he's also the president of European Pen. And his new book is, uh, which he has behind him too, is The, the Rat Line, which is a, a great book and really opens up a story that helps us understand issues of, um, of hatred. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to, Philippe is going to talk for about uh, half an hour or so, and then I'm gonna moderate questions. So um, feel free as we're going along to put in the Q&A box, uh, what questions you have, and then I'll remind you again when Philippe uh, finishes talking, and then we'll continue the discussion and we'll finish on the hour. So thank you very much, Philippe. I appreciate you being here with us today. Right. Well, thank you, Ken, and it's uh, terrific to be here um, with you and to spend a bit of time talking about my new book. Uh, I thought what I'd do is just begin by uh, situating it in its context. Um, Ken has introduced the kind of things that I do. I'm a professor and I'm a practicing, practitioner, practicing lawyer, and I do international cases on crimes against humanity and genocide. And about 10 years ago, in, 19, in 2010, I was invited to give uh, a lecture in the Ukrainian city of Lviv uh, on the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, South America, so on and so forth. And I accepted, um, not because I had a burning desire to uh, give a lecture on that subject, but because I wanted to go to Lviv. And the reason that I wanted to go to Lviv was that it used to be called Lvov in Poland, uh, and before that Lemberg, and it's where my grandfather was born in 1904. Um, and he lived there until 1914, uh, left behind a large family, went to Vienna uh, and made a new life for himself as a young boy with his mother and his sisters uh, in Vienna. In doing the work that prepared for that lecture in Lviv in 2010, I was very surprised to discover that the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide could be traced to the city of Lviv. And the folks who had invited me did not know that fact. Uh, I discovered that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into the Nuremberg Statute, Hirsch Lauterpach, professor of law at Cambridge, had been a student at the law faculty that invited me from 1915 to 1990. I was amazed by that. And then I was even more amazed to discover that the man who invented the concept of genocide, Raphael Lemkin, uh, had also been a student at that law faculty in Lviv and the folks who invited me weren't aware of that either. Uh, that was uh, from 1921 to 1926. So I started writing a book about the three men, my grandfather Leon, Lauterpacht and Lemkin. And then into the story came a fourth man, Hans Frank, who had been Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to about 1933, and then later governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland based in Krakow at the Wawel Castle. And in doing the research about Frank, I also came across a man called Otto Wächter, who was Frank's deputy. He was the governor from 1939 of Krakow, and then from 1942, he became governor uh, of District Galicia based in Lemberg. And of course, what I discovered was that Hans Frank and Otto Wächter 
were the two senior Nazis who had overseen the destruction of my grandfather's entire family. So I started getting interested in Frank and Vechter. For the book East West Street, I focused on Frank and I came to meet his son, Nicholas, who'd written a book I called In the Shadow of the Reich, um, an excoriating account of the crimes of his father. And I met Nick, uh, Frank, with some trepidation, uh, which was misplaced because he turned out to be an absolutely lovely person. Uh, the very first thing he said to me was, I'm against the death penalty in all cases, except in the case of my father. He was a criminal and he deserved to be hanged for the crimes he committed. And at a certain early point in our exchanges, when we met, Nick said to me, Philippe, you're interested in Lemberg, Lvov, Lviv. Would you like to meet the son of my father's deputy, Otto Wächter? The son is called Horst Wächter. He said, he's different from me, but you'll like him. And I said, what do you mean different from me? And he said, well, he loves his father. He thinks his father was involved. He's not an anti-Semite. He's not a Holocaust denier, but he looks for the good in his father. So I said, sure. So by now we're at the end of 2011, and I uh, went with Nick Frank to visit uh, Horst. Uh, Nicholas is German, Horst is Austrian, uh, and he lives in a vast dilapidated uh, castle in a very parlous state in northern uh, Austria in pretty impecunious circumstances. He's a lovely, sweet man. Both Nicholas and Horst were born in 1939, but as I said, they have very different attitudes to their fathers. One, Nicholas hates his father, the other, Horst, loves his father. I wrote a profile of Nick for, of, of Horst for the Financial Times, which was published in 2013, and that generated rather more interest than I expected. And out of it came a commission to make a BBC documentary, which some of you may have seen, called My Nazi Legacy, What Our Fathers Did. And um, with in the making of that, uh, documentary film, which you can get on iTunes and Amazon and Apple TV or whatever. Um, we went, the three of us, to Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov. And um, in the course of the filming at a certain moment, which at that point, by now we're 2014, I was very focused on what Otto Wächter had done during the war, what he had done as governor of Krakow, which was to build the Krakow ghetto, what he had done in Lemberg, which was to oversee the extermination of more than half a million Jews in the region around Lemberg. Uh, and what had happened after the war was not much of much interest to me. I knew he'd been indicted for mass murder, but that he had disappeared. During the filming of the documentary, at a certain moment in one of the interviews I did with Nick Frank, Nick said, you know, I think Horst is a new kind of Nazi, or he could be a new kind of Nazi. And I disagreed with that. And I said that I disagreed with it on camera. Uh, but when Horst saw that footage, he was very upset. And in fact, he and Nick have never repaired their relationship since Nicholas said that. Uh, Nicholas has since retracted that view, incidentally. But I was uh, then very surprised when Horst uh, Bechter said to me, Philippe, I'm not a Nazi. How can I prove that I'm not a Nazi? And it's always difficult, as many of you will know, as I know as a, as a lawyer, to prove a negative. And I thought about it. And in the end, I, I said, well, why don't you give this extraordinary family archive that you have of your parents, his mother Charlotte, his father Otto, diaries, letters, to a museum because Nazis don't give this kind of material to museums. He said that was a terrific idea. And uh, I introduced him to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, a wonderful curator there, Anatole Steck. And the two worked together and the material was digitized and was made available uh, to the Washington Museum. In fact, just a few months ago, it's been put on the website. So if you are interested in the family archive, all you need to do is uh, type in Vechta Archive Holocaust Memorial Museum and you can go and see everything yourself. Horst said, would you like a copy? This is back in 2014. I said, sure. And a couple of weeks later, a 
tatty used recycled envelope popped its way into my letterbox and inside was a single USB stick. I put it into my computer and was amazed by what I found. It told the story of Charlotte and Otto Wächter through their own writings, 10,000 pages of documents from the moment they met in 1929 in April to the moment he died in July 1949 in a Vatican run hospital uh, in Rome, the Santo Spiritu, uh, in the arms of a very infamous uh, Vatican bishop, the Austrian bishop Alois. Hudal. And what we have with this material uniquely is the inside life of a top table Nazi and his wife, the correspondence between them in both directions and their diaries. And the material was of particular interest for me, not just because of what it allowed me to understand of Otto's situation during the war, but I think even more interestingly in catalyzing what happened after the war. So I've shared with you the pre-war horrors in which Otto Wächter was involved, totally supported by his wife. And that's one of the fascinations that Charlotte Wächter was deeply complicit in the crimes of her husband. She was at the very least an enabler and she may have been worse. To give you an example, December, 1939, Otto Wächter writes home, he's by then in Krakow, his wife is still in Vienna in an expropriated house belonging to Jews who have fled back to Australia. And he writes to his wife, my darling uh, Humschen, uh, wonderful days in Krakow. The Vienna Philharmonic has been to visit lots of uh, notables, ministers, Baldur von Schirach, Robert Ley and others. A uh, little bit of local difficulty um, an attempt on the life of the governor general, Hans Frank. Uh, tomorrow I have to have 50 poles shot. That was the kind of correspondence that was being written, absolutely chilling. And the correspondence, of course, describes uh, not only the work that Wächter is doing, the Juden Aktion, the rounding up of the Jews in Lemberg, but while that is going on, juxtaposed with Charlotte Wächter's idyllic life of lounging around in the Austrian Alps, uh, going to concerts at the Salzburg Festival, uh, going to the opera uh, at Bayreuth in the presence of Hitler and with Himmler. Uh, Wächter was a protege of Himmler's immediately under him in the SS. And it's this personal detail that I think is so compelling uh, and fascinating. But at the end of the day, it wasn't for me the most compelling and fascinating. The most compelling and fascinating was the extraordinary material that dealt with the events after the 9th of May, 1945. Because on that day, indicted for mass murder, genocide and crimes against humanity, Otto Wächter disappeared off the face of the earth. And this material allowed me and a wonderful group of researchers, James Everest, Leah Mein Klingst and others, to reconstitute the story of what happened. If you are indicted for mass murder, more than half a million people, and you're hunted by the Americans, by the Soviets, by the Poles, by the British, by the Jews, what do you do to escape? And the letters and diaries of Charlotte and Otto Wächter provide a complete account of that story and the answer to that question. The complexity and the reason that it took four years to decipher was that because they believed they were being followed by the intelligence services of various countries, all of the names and all of the places are in code. And so it took us a long time to decipher the identities. But the story that emerges on Otto Wächter's quest to reach the rat line and get to Argentina, the rat line is the Reich migratory route from Italy to Argentina is extraordinary. We now know, as I describe in the book, uh, that when the war ended, Wächter met in a small Austrian village called Maria Pfarr, uh, a young 
uh, German SS soldier called Burkhard Ratzmann, or referred to as Buko. And Burkhard Ratzmann had been in SS units in uh, Yugoslavia and Italy, and his job was to survive at high altitudes and kill partisans, opponents of the Nazi or Mussolini-led fascist regime. He was a mountain killer. And it was Buko Ratman who said to Wächter, I will save you by taking you to a place where the British and the Americans are too lazy to go. We will go up. We will go into the mountains. We will go above 2,000 meters, and there we will be safe. They will not find us. And the correspondence describes their life in three years in those circumstances. Charlotte, the wife, herself a very able, highly intelligent graphic designer, the mother of their six children, of whom Horst was number four, every two or three weeks would take an arduous journey to a mountain spot. She would climb up the mountain alone, often with 25 or 30 kilos of provisions food, newspapers, shoes, skis, the various other things they needed for survival at high altitude, spend a couple of days with her husband and then go back home, always worrying that she was followed. At a certain point, I said to Horst, tell me about this Burkhardt Hartmann. Why did he do what he did? What was his motivation? What had he done during the war? Did the family stay in touch with him later? And Horst looked at me sweetly and said, um, you know, Philippe, I can answer all of your questions, or we could telephone Buko. So that rather surprised me. This was 2016, 2017, and uh, 72 years after uh, the escape. Uh, I did not expect Buko Ratman to be alive, but he was. And we did telephone him, and we spoke to him, and even better, six weeks later in January 2017, uh, I went to visit Buko with Horst uh, and with my research assistants and was able to get a first-hand account of how they had escaped and how they had survived for three years. It was remarkable conversation in many ways, not least because I spotted on Buko Ratman's bookshelf in January 2017 in central Germany, a neat little portrait of Adolf Hitler. Uh, the good old days, Buko would say to me uh, later on during the interview. They lasted like that for three years. And then Wächter decided it was time to come down from the mountains and make a proper escape to a place of absolute safety, Argentina, which was the place to go. Uh, he comes down, he stays home with Charlotte for a bit in Salzburg, and then decides to cross the Dolomites by himself on foot in February. I followed in June, and that was arduous enough, I can assure you, and makes his way to Rome. And then the material becomes utterly fascinating and exhilarating. His first letter home to Charlotte on the 29th of April, 1949, gives you a flavor. I've arrived, I'm safe. I was met by the religious gentleman. Of course, he never mentions the actual name of the religious gentleman, uh, but uh, we were able to work it out and it was Alois uh, Hudal. And he survives in Rome for three months. He needs money, he extraordinarily, He's helped by a whole raft of characters, fascists, Nazis, extraordinary group of characters. Uh, and he earns money by appearing as a film extra in films being made at Chinechita. You literally could not invent uh, this story. Now, unbeknownst to him, he is on the radar of the Poles and the Americans and the Jews. And what has actually happened is that the Americans have uh, created in 1947, the US Army's counterintelligence corps, uh, a unit for tracking down Nazis. And the unit is called Project Los Angeles. And Project Los Angeles is also tasked with creating a network of spies and agents who will assist in the new fight, which is against the Soviets. And this uh, is the point where I got really bowled over by what I discovered, helped greatly by Professor Norman Goda down in Florida and Professor David Kurtzer at Brown University, who's won a Pulitzer Prize 
deservedly for his work on Mussolini and the Popes, and learned that Project Los Angeles was uh, a group of nine special agents hired by the Americans under the direction of a man called Thomas Lucid, American agent. The main agent was a senior SS officer indicted for mass murder who had been hired by the Americans. And he hired eight sub-agents, three Nazis, three Italian fascists, and two senior Vatican officials. One of them was Bishop Alois Hudal, who was a spy for the Americans from 1947 to 1951, paid $50 in cash each month. The other agent of the Americans was Pope Pius XII's press spokesperson, a cardinal even higher than a bishop. He too, $50 in cash a month. And of course that raises the very serious question of whether Pius XII himself was involved in working with these Nazis and fascists against the coming communist threat. I don't wanna give everything away, uh, Vechter, on the weekend of the 2nd and 3rd of July, 1949, goes to visit an old comrade, which means an SS colleague, uh, at Lake Albano, near Castel Gandolfo, home, summer home of the Pope. Uh, he has a marvellous weekend. He writes home to Charlotta about it, uh, who is back in Salzburg, and arrives back in Rome on the 4th, writes to her and says, I'm feeling ill, and 10 days later he dies. And one of the enduring mysteries is what was the cause of his death? Did he fall ill, leptospirosis, Viles disease, an illness picked up swimming in the polluted Tiber River, or was he po poisoned? So that, in a nutshell, is the Ratline story. It uh, blew me over, I have to say. There was much that I had not expected. But most significantly, we learn about family life uh, at the Nazi top table. We learn about how anti-Semitism is formed at an early age, how it is applied. And one of the themes of the book is about crossing lines. Vechter crossed lines very early. In 1921, as a university student, uh, he was beating up Jews. In 1923, he joined the Nazi party. In 1934, he led the plot against Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus, who is killed in a failed coup d'etat, sort of Austrian equivalent to the 6th of January insurrection in this country, or in the United States. And of course, uh, Vechter flees Austria in 34 and returns triumphant to stand on the balcony overlooking the Heldenplatz, one meter from Adolf Hitler on the 15th of March, 1938. So it's a complex, troubling story uh, I've come to know the son very well. I'm deeply grateful to him for having given me the material. Uh, I don't think he's thrilled with the book that I've written, and some of his family members are less than thrilled uh, with uh, what he has done in giving me this material, it has to be said, but not all of them. Uh, and I'll leave that maybe for questions. Let me just stop there. That gives you a flavor of what this book is about. And let's now throw it open to uh, a conversation, uh, Kenneth, and uh, and questions as you see appropriate. Thank you so much for that overview, uh, Philippe. And I uh, invite people to put questions in the Q and A. And while that's populating up, I have a couple of things I wanted to um, ask you as well. I mean, the, the the book I highly recommend. It's you know a fascinating story with the plot line, the characters, but it really gives us a lot of opportunity to think deeply about issues of, of hatred. And Horst, who you clearly like, I mean, is somebody that you not only made it possible for you to write this book, but you, you'd like him. Um, there's, you know, there's a, a conundrum, at least when I'm reading about it, is that he sees his father, whether it's because he has respect for his mother and his mother, you know, was, was championing uh, her husband or for whatever other reasons, he sees his father as a decent human being and he can't conceptualize that one could be a good father uh, in lots of ways, uh, you know, a decent husband, although as your book 
points out he wasn't probably a decent husband. Um, but I won't give that away. Um, but he just can't resonate with the, those two things at the same time that my father could have been a good guy at home, uh, but you know, responsible for mass murder and genocide and being part of, of a, a machine that, that produced that. So I'm wondering, do you ever have conversations with him about that? Um, yes. Yes. And can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? How did, how, did, how did he put those two things in his mind? Well, uh, you know, at, at certain points, Horst would say to me, you know, Philippe, I didn't really know my father. I was, he was born in 39. Um, his father was away quite a lot. Uh, after 1945, he never really saw his father again because his father disappeared. So there's this tiny period. And what he says is, you know what? Actually, it's not so much that I loved my father but that I really loved my mother and my mother really loved me. And since my mother loved my father, essentially I will honor my mother by seeking to find the good in my father. So one of the extraordinary things about the archive is it not only contains the material between 1929 and 1949, but it contains 35 years of material after Otto's death, when Charlotte seeks to resurrect his reputation. And Horst obviously knows this material well. For example, Charlotte spends 30 years tracking down Otto's former comrades, his old colleagues, and interviewing them to find out the good things. As she says in one of her own later diaries, I don't want to believe, I don't want my children to believe that their father was a mass murderer who killed Jews, which is what he was. I want them to see the good in my father. And I think Horst has read that material. Not only that, all of the interviews that she did over many years, unbelievably Charlotte recorded. So I've got the tapes uh, of uh, her interviewing the old comrades to learn more about the greatness of her husband. And Horst too has listened to this material. And so I think what's going on here, uh, and early on in the relationship, I was sufficiently concerned to retain the support and services of a leading psychiatrist and psychoanalyst to help me steer through this maze, is that it's really about the child's love of the mother, not the love of the father. He is honoring the father in order to honor Charlotte who nurtured him after the war, who looked after him well after the war. And to understand the levels of these complexities of who we're dealing with here, a couple of anecdotes. Horst was married to a lady called Jacqueline, a Swedish lady who passed away whilst I was writing the book. And at one point, Jacqueline pulled me over and said, I want to tell you a story. Um, you need to know how crazy Horst was about his mother. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he, there would be occasions where he would have dinner with her every night, and then he'd have a second dinner with me every night. And I divorced him because of it. I couldn't stand it. And then when his mother died, I remarried him. So, <laughs> you know, to understand this person, you need to know the complete family story. And I think the Horst project and the denial is not so much motivated by the desire to resurrect the reputation of the father, but to keep alive the flame held by his mother. Thank you. So uh, another question from the attendees is Horst still alive and how many of his five siblings are also alive? and which are not pleased with him for sharing family secrets. Right. So Otto and Charlotte have produced six children, uh, four girls and two boys. Uh, of those six, only three are still alive, um, Horst and uh, two of his sisters. Uh, interestingly, all of the sisters left Austria. As Horst put it, uh, the mother did not have a good relationship with the daughters, but she loved her sons. The six children produced 23 grandchildren. 
And those 23 grandchildren, I have had quite a lot of contact with by amazing coincidence. I used to teach at New York University and one of my students at NYU is married to one of the grandsons of Otto Wächter. Uh, she at one point invited me for dinner in Vienna to meet the grandson, which I did, and it was very interesting. And at one point when the grandson of the Wächters had left to use the men's room in the restaurant, she leaned over and said to me, Philippe, can I ask you a question? And I said, yes, of course. And she said, well, could I just ask you to make sure that your film and anything you write about my family and my husband's grandfather is never published in Austria? I said, no, of course, I can't promise you that. I, I'm a believer in free speech. And, uh, you know, and I said, but, I said, but why? She said, to protect the children, to protect our child. Charlotte cleansed the Wächter name, and it is true. Until I wrote this book, you would not have found very much about Otto Wächter, and it has come back roaring, if you like, as a name, as a top table uh, Nazi. Other grandchildren have got in touch with me uh, in different ways. One of them, uh, it's a very deeply Catholic family, parts of it. Uh, one of them got in touch and asked me to forgive the grandfather before the book was published which I declined to do, but I did um, offer to travel to Rome, uh, the Vatican, and meet some of the bishops and cardinals I'd met to have a conversation about reconciliation, but I'm still waiting for a reply uh, to that uh, offer. And then, of course, there is the matter of Horst's only child. Uh, I don't want to give away too much, but she makes a rather dramatic appearance uh, at the end of the book, and those of you who might have seen an article I wrote a few weeks ago in the New Yorker magazine, uh, will know a little bit more about Magdalena Wächter. Uh, so this is an immensely complex issue. Um, on the one hand, I don't like Horst's views and his denial of his father's criminality. On the other hand, I'm very respectful of the fact that he's made this material publicly available uh, at a great cost to himself in terms of his family. It's a very, very difficult situation. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you discuss the origins of anti-Semitism in Otto's life? Well, um, I can actually, and I do touch upon it. And it's, um, I mean, they were both deeply anti-Semitic, uh, Charlotte and Otto, but in different ways. It's very clear that Otto's anti-Semitism came via his father, who was an ardent German nationalist, a military man who'd fought in the, you know, imperial uh, K Ut K army of the um, uh, of the emperor, and had come back after the First World War, which was lost, which was followed by the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, into a Vienna in which the Ostjuden, the Eastern Jews, uh, had. Um, migrated into Vienna. And that, I believe, was the source, a combination of German national nationalism and horror at the purity of Austrian life somehow being overcome by these East European Jews who had migrated uh, after the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed. Charlotte and, and, and Otto Wächter was of the Catholic faith. Charlotte's anti-Semitism, which was very deep also, surprisingly, she came from a small town called Murzuschlag in Styria, uh, a town where there were only about 20 uh, Jews in, in the town of many thousands of people. And her father was a steel maker and the employer of, you know, largest employer in the town. So very wealthy family, relatively speaking. It's clear that the anti-Semitism came through the church and came through the teachings uh, of the church. We know already by 18 that she was very anti-Semitic. Um, she was a troublesome young lady uh, and her parents decided to send her uh, to Britain, to England, to a public school uh, to be toughened up. Uh, and on the way from Austria to England, she travels by train and she describes in her diaries at the age of 17, having flirted with a Jew on the train and from that you're able to divine uh, the early sense of hatred um, that just flows like a river 
through all of her writings, right up until the moment of her death. As Jacqueline said, she was a Nazi and an anti-Semite until the day she died. Thank you. And related to that, did the man you went to see in Germany, the one that was called on the phone, is he still a dedicated Nazi, the one that had the picture of Hitler on his shelf? Burkhardt Ratman, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, the interview that he gave me is the only interview he has ever given. And the reason for that, his daughter explained, um, was that he worried like many of these old guys who are still being extradited today from the United States uh, to Germany, camp guards and others, that he would be indicted for international crimes. He was a mountain killer. He killed thousands of people, uh, Italians, partisans, villagers in very, very large numbers. Um, it, the condition that he imposed upon me uh, was um, for giving the interview was that I asked no question about anything he did before the 9th of May 1945. If I asked any such question, the interview would be terminated. So I did ask no question. Um, he was certainly a true believer during the war, but he was a young man. And of course, he'd grown up in a period of total indoctrination. Uh, I don't know if he's still a Nazi today or whether the uh, photograph of Adolf Hitler was simply a happy memory uh, of the years of his youth. Um, uh, he certainly did not appear to be um, antithetical towards Adolf Hitler, I would put it that way. Um, and from that, I think it's reasonable uh, to suppose that he was not utterly appalled uh, by what Hitler did. Uh, that seems clear enough to me. Thank you. Um, the qu next question is, the rat line must have uh, given access to, of escape to other Nazis on the run. Who else benefited, benefited from it? Did they arrive in Argentina? Does Eichmann fit in this description? Um, yes, the rat line is, if you like, um, singular in nature. It's the famous rat line. Uh, uh, Alois Judal helped many of the big names. Um, he helped um, Joseph Mengele, Eric Priebke, uh, loads of the big names and hundreds, if not thousands of others. He didn't, there is no evidence he actually helped Eichmann, although Eichmann did escape uh, on the same rat line route from uh, Genova uh, by boat uh, to Argentina. Um, what is frankly shocking for me in the material that I discovered here was that the Americans knew all about the rat line. Um, indeed, I think it's probably possible to conclude that the Americans, the Allies, the British were involved also, used the rat line as a recruiting tool to find people who could help against the Soviets. Uh, uh, the Americans and the British worried that the Soviets were going to take over in Italy. This, I have to say, I found very dispiriting. There's a section in the book where I describe my conversations with my neighbor, the late great spy writer John Le Carre. Um, I had stumbled into this material about uh, espionage and the Cold War. I thought I'll go and ask Le Carre, he knows all about this stuff. I went to see him and he surprised me enormously. The first thing he said was, Yes, Philippe, I know all about this. I was there in 1949. I said, what do you mean you were there? He said, I was an 18 year old young British soldier and I was involved in interrogating Germans in displaced persons camps. And I said, interrogating for what purpose? To prosecute them? He said, no, it was to recruit them, to recruit them against the Soviets. And I said, why? He said, because we wanted their Rolodexes and this we wanted their address lists. We wanted to know what they knew. We wanted to know who they knew. And this, I think, is extremely dispiriting. But uh, again, I don't want to give too much away, uh, spoiler alert, um, but this was an aspect of the book that troubled me greatly. The use of Nazi mass murderers by the Allies, knowing that they had been involved in the most terrible deeds. 
And related to that as a question, it seems that the rat line was at least partially financed from the US, particularly the American National Catholic Welfare Conference. Any comment on that? Um, again, I'm not an expert on all the details of all the funding, but it's, uh, shall we say, uh, not very difficult to find the points of connection between um, various organizations, including the one mentioned, uh, and the financing of the rat line, or at least the assistance, getting people papers, getting people the ID cards, getting people the travel documents, helping them uh, to get abroad to safety in South America. Uh, and um, it's absolutely clear from the evidence um, that the Americans and the British were well aware of what was going on. Um, whether they were actually funding it, I do not know. What we do know is that they were funding senior Nazi mass murderers, paying them in cash to be agents, knowing them to be mass murderers. One of the characters in the book, I won't tell you exactly who he is in relation to the story, is called Karl Haas. Karl Haas would be indicted for mass murder by the Italians in relation to the single, single largest act of killing in the history of Italy, the killing of 335 Italians, including numerous Jews and communists in something called the Fosse Ardiatina, right in the center of Rome in the spring of 1943. Karl Haas, who features in my story and in my book and was a spy for the Americans for four and a half years until he was let go because they feared he was a double agent for the Soviets, would in the end be indicted in 1994, following a remarkable interview by Sam Donaldson and Eric Priebke in Argentina, which unearthed the Haas-Priebke relationship. And in 1998, Karl Haas was sentenced to life imprisonment uh, in Italy. He was an American agent. So this is a very dispiriting story at a certain level. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, did Charlotte uh, remarry after Otto died? And I guess more generally, you know, what, what did she do without giving away too much of the book about after he died? Well, she spent, um, Charlotte did not remarry. Um, she, she spent a great deal of her life writing lengthy memoirs seeking to exonerate uh, her late husband. Um, she, uh, well, I'll give you an example of the kind of lady she was. Uh, Otto Wechter died on July the 13th, 1949. Uh, he was buried in the Central Cemetery in Rome, the Verano Cemetery, on the 16th of July, 1949. Ten years later, in early 1960, Bishop Udall got in touch with Charlotte and said, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, Madame Wechter, or Baroness Wechter, that uh, as he was dying in my arms, uh, your husband told me he wanted to be buried in the homeland in Austria. I think you should come and get him. So Charlotte indeed um, took steps to exhume her husband's body and sought permission to bring him back to Austria for burial in Austria. Permission was refused by the Italian authorities. Uh, but they did give permission for the exhumation and the reburial elsewhere in Italy. And one of the Vesta children was by then married to an Italian living in Palermo in Sicily. So she got permission to build a mausoleum in Palermo and rebury Otto there. And that was the plan. She took the body out of the ground. The body was loaded in, into her car. And the next thing that you, and the only reason that I know this is the next thing that happened is that Interpol were hunting for the body of Otto Wechter. In the materials that Horst gave me, I found clippings from various newspapers, Interpol searches for the corpse of Italian, of, of, of Nazi mass murderer Otto Wechter. And I said to Horst, what happened? He said, well, um, what do you mean what happened? I said, well, the body disappeared. What happened to the body? And Horst, looked at me, smiled and said, mother brought him home. And I said, well, what do you mean mother brought him home? She said, well, as you know, mother was running a guest house called 
Haus Wartenberg, which still operates today uh, with one of her grandchildren, in case any of you are in Salzburg. And uh, she ran it as a German language school, and she buried him in the garden uh, of the Haus Wartenberg. And I said, you're kidding me. And he said, no, I'm not kidding you at all. And when the book was published um, in Britain, I started getting letters from people saying they'd been pupils at Haus Wartenberg with Frau Wächter, and they had no idea that what her husband had done or that he was buried in the garden where they would have their breakfast every morning. So Charlotte Wächter, it's the short way of saying, devoted the rest of her life to the adulation of her late husband. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, we know many Nazi mass murderers were spirited away to South America, but it is, is it not also true that many thousands found their way into the US and Canada? I don't know about the numbers. It's certainly true that some did find their way. Um, one of the interesting communities that's uh, at issue here uh, is in relation to Canada. Some of you will know, maybe some of you are watching from Canada. The book has just been published also in Canada, so I've had quite a few uh, communications about this, but Canada has a very large um, Ukrainian community. That community is in part populated by descendants of something called uh, the Waffen-SS Ukrainian Division. Uh, the Waffen-SS Ukrainian Division was created by Otto Wächter, who is the hero of the division, in 1943. Um, when Wächter arrived in Lemberg, he found a community um, which was divided between Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians. The Jews were basically killed. The Poles were treated as fifth class citizens and the Ukrainians were elevated. And so Wächter is seen by some in the ultra nationalist Ukrainian community as something of a, as a, of a hero because he rekindled the notion of Ukrainian nationalism. And there are, uh, after the war, efforts to ensure that the Waffen-SS Galicia Division, the Ukrainian division, is not sent as Stalin wanted for treatment uh, to the Soviet Union, but is uh, spirited out to Britain and Canada, which is what happens. And you will find monuments today to the Waffen-SS Galicia Division. They don't, they leave out the SS bits on the public monuments, but you will find monuments to the, you get the it's called the Galician Division, but it's an SS division founded by Otto Wächter. So we do know, yes, indeed, there are remnants of uh, Otto Wächter's largesse in other parts of the world. Thank you. Um, can you say the name of the town again where you, this book and your other book, you know, uh, yes. focused on, and talk a little bit more about it? Well, um, it's an amazing city. If you are able to go, um, you should go. It's very safe. Um, it, it was called from about 1772 to uh, 1918, Lemberg, L-E-M-B-E-R-G. Then in 1918, the city became a part of Poland and the city became Lwów, L-W-O-W, in Poland. And then in 1939, um, the Soviets took over and it became Lvov, L-V-O-V. -V. Then in 1941, the Germans took it over again and it became Lemberg once more until the summer of 1944. And then the Soviet Red Army liberated, shall we say, the city and it became Lvov. And then in Ukraine, Lviv, which is what it is called today. It's one of the most beautiful cities I've ever visited. The inner city is completely undamaged uh, and intact. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, a medieval uh, city, beautiful, uh, very much constructed in the style of Vienna. Anyone who's been to Vienna will find it very familiar. It's one of the uh, places where you get the best coffee in the world because it was a, a trading hub uh, between East and West. It's literally on the fault line. Uh, of East and West. Um, and um, I go back very, very frequently. I'm uh, able to write East West Street and the Rat Line in large part from some remarkable Ukrainian scholars and historians who helped me a lot. 
and only now is the Jewish history of the city uh, being allowed, if you like, to be uh, revisited. And I have to say there are now east-west walking tours uh, of uh, Lviv, and next year um, with the Stephen Ambrose Touring Society, there will be, I think, a huge gathering um, of people who want to visit uh, the city. It's an absolutely remarkable city with a very, very dark history. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to ask you another question. If people have more questions, please add them to the Q&A. But one thing I didn't want to let you leave without addressing. So reading about Horst and, you know, a couple of things about him. One is, of, um, and I won't give away, you know, what happens in the book, but you mentioned the, about the question of did he die, did Otto die of poisoning? I mean, it's fair to say that Horst was probably the largest proponent of that theory, at least that comes, so he yeah. believes in that sort of the conspiracy of somebody, you know, may have poisoned my, my dad. Um, we, you know, anti-Semitism is at heart conspiracy theory. So the connection between the two, and then I was reading about that. I have to tell you, I was thinking of, about David Irving uh, because I, I presume most people in the audience know, but the ones who don't, David Irving was a Holocaust denier who uh, was sued, who actually sued Deborah Lipstadt, a, a scholar for what she wrote about him as a Holocaust denier. There's a big trial in London that I was honored to play a small role in in 2000. But one of the things that I saw about Irving who had this sort of conspiratorial view of the world is that he would, you know, you'd, you'd get him, you'd show him the evidence, he'd say, you got me basically. And then 15 minutes later, it was like it never happened. He would just go back to the, and, and I got that feeling with Horace too. There was evidence about what his father did and yeah. he would sort of negotiate that. And then he'd pull back and go back to, you know, no, my father was a good yeah. guy. So, and, you know, and you've done trials of genocide and, and all those things. How do people, um, you know, look at, at those, those issues where, the, where they get, a, you know, the evidence comes, but then they go back to what they want to believe, basically. He it's knows, like, he knows, <laughs> he knows, but he cannot permit himself to accept that he knows. That's very, very clear to me. There is no evidence to exonerate. Um, his father. Uh, the poisoning theory is very interesting. Um, the poisoning theory starts with Alois Hudal's memoir, which was only published after he died in the mid-1960s. But I went back to the archives and found the original manuscript, which dates to 1953, four years after Wächter died. And in the original manuscript, in other words, it wasn't a late edition, Hudal writes that as he lay dying in his ar in, in my arms, um, Otto Wächter, the governor, told me that he had been poisoned by a former comrade who was working for the Americans. And that was picked up by Charlotta. Now, pause for a moment. Who has an incentive in creating a poisoning theory? Alois Hudal. He, there is a question I can see from Jan Cohen asking whatever happened to Hudal. Hudal lost his position in 1952. He was forced to resign following the publication of a series of newspaper articles in the Italian press, scandalous articles, which showed that he had been harboring Nazis. And this made his position untenable in 1953. So he was let go and he went to retirement at Castel Gandolfo near Lake Albano. A year after he goes into retirement, he writes this memoir. And of course, what better way of exonerating yourself than by turning a perpetrator, Wächter, into a victim? And one theory is that he spun that theory in order to protect himself. Charlotta then runs with the poisoning theory passes it on to Horst, who himself then picks it up. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail because the readers will form their own view as to the two theories. I am, I have to say, more persuaded by the swimming in the Tiber River leptospirosis theory. But let me share this with you. 
two weeks ago, I received a letter from a gentleman in Jerusalem. He wrote to say that he'd read my book, The Vat Line, with great interest. Why? Because his father-in-law, a man called Sergio Minervi, who had published a memoir in 2017, two years before he passed away, was an Italian Jew born in 1925, who had been hidden in a monastery in Rome during the German occupation. In 1945, he went to Palestine. He became an early participant in what would be called Mossad, the Italian, the Israeli intelligence service. And in 1948, he was sent back to Rome. What was his task in Rome? His tasks included two of relevance for me and for this book. One task was to hunt for Nazis in Rome. And the second task was to track everything that Bishop Alois Hudal got up to. So it is not a great leap of imagination to imagine that Sergio Minerbi, who was in Rome whilst Wächter was there, might well have come to know of Wächter's presence and Hudal's role in protecting him. Even more interestingly, in his memoir, Minerbi writes that I returned to Israel in August 1949. In other words, three weeks after Wächter died. From this, it is at least possible to construct in one's imagination, if not elsewhere, that Minerbi, who was accompanied by three other hitmen on behalf of Israel and Jewry, may have had some hand in some of these matters. Minerbi, before he died, sought access to the Israeli archives. His memory had faded. He didn't remember exactly what he had done 70 years earlier. Remember, he's writing in 2017 about events in 1949. And he asks for permission to have access to his own archival record in Israel, and this is denied. The son-in-law now wants access to the record to find out what exactly his father-in-law got up to. It's, it, it, and I have to say, receiving that letter, nudged me once more towards this complex door. Well, hmm, maybe there is something there. But the balance of evidence, I think, is firmly in favor of leptospirosis. It sounds like, you know, this detective story is never going to end for you. Never ends. Never ends, Ken. Let me ask you one final question. Um, and you've been very generous with, with your time and knowledge. But one thing that, that jumped out at me about Charlotta at, in the book, she's Right, she's talking about Otto, and she says he refused to shoot innocent people. And what struck me is, you know, clearly Jews were not seen as innocent people. But what, do you think? Do you think she didn't see them as innocent, or didn't see them as people? I mean, which didn't, didn't didn't see them as people, Kenna. Um, there's a very interesting letter that she writes to Otto in the spring of 1945 it's clear by then that the war is coming to an end everything is crashing down disaster looms she writes to her husband and she said look I've, I've, I've had a really good idea maybe you could pass it on to the Fuhrer why don't we cut a deal with the British against the Soviets she writes and then she thinks no of course not that's absurd because of the Jews they're always there contaminating everything, stopping decent things from happening. I mean, it's incredible. You know, it goes back from the letter she writes as a 17 year old, right up to the moment where the war is coming to an end. She's obsessed by it. Horst did tell me a story though, which I didn't put in the book, which was surprising, which is that right at the end of her life, she became deeply religious and she befriended a Catholic priest and together, almost unbelievably, they went to visit Israel. And um, one of her granddaughters is now a nun living in Jerusalem. 
So um, it's very hard to invent characters like this, uh, I have to say. Fact is truly stranger than fiction. Well, and you know the the fact and the, and of the matter is that both of these books I highly recommend to everybody. And we were talking before you have a third one that's sort of in this trilogy that's coming out in twenty twenty four that I look forward to re reading. Probably not as much as you look forward to finishing <laughs> writing. Um, but I want to thank you again for your generosity of time, for your work, your scholarship, your humanity, and uh, really helping us think through these issues with a, with a story that's incredibly fascinating. And as you were saying, it's not entirely over yet either. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your attention, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Kenneth. Take care. Yeah.